Thank you, Alexei. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of the of the conference for for the invitation, and well, I am really glad to be here to participate in this wonderful conference. Uh, I also consider my, uh, my my participation and well, uh, my talk as a, as a small contribution to the successful development, future su successful development of the Mathematical Center here. So as Alexi said, well, this and the next next talk, uh, they were. This is a, a small introduction to to Sanak's conjecture. So I'm going. So so the first lecture is the. We intend to 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 show. I intend to show you why. I mean, to answer questions, basic questions. Why Sanak's conjecture is difficult. Why why Sanak's conjecture is important. And the next talk will be rather concentrated on, on tools. How, how can we show that certain classes of dynamical system, they satisfy Sarnak's San San conjecture. OK, so let's start very briefly with some recallings, because most of the notions which you can see here, they already appeared in, in, in the lectures by Terence Town or Vitaly Bergelson. So you have the notion of multiplicative function, so which is just this condition, uh, uh, where m and n are co-prime, co and then the definition of the of the Mebius function, uh, which is some kind of measuring the parity. Uh, if if you look at the uh, representation of, of of a natural number as product of prime numbers, and very related to to this, to the to the to the Mebius function, the Louville function, uh, which is defined as, you know, it measures what is the number, what is the parity of the factors, prime factors of the of the natural number, and there is this obvious relationship between between these these two multiplicative functions. Mu square is nothing but the characteristic function of the of the set of square free numbers, and it was also already said that well both these functions Mebius function reveal functions are related to prime number theorem in the sense that the prime number <coughs> theorem is equivalent to the fact that the mean of the Mebius function or the mean of the reveal function is, is equal to zero so it's a, of course especially these kind of facts they, they look very simple right but that, that's the, the fact that these things are equivalent to the prime number theorem is a first word warning that well the problems we are going to to consider are not that simple <coughs> so p and t is of course if you look at at the mean here the mean statement so then the p and t is of course about the cancellations of plus and minus ones and as i think it was already mentioned by 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 terence Tao, that if if you think about some quantitative cancellation so then well you, you, you just encounter a Riemann hypothesis. Uh, so let's now go to one more, uh, one more unsolved problem, conjecture by Chawla from 1965. And this conjecture, which was already mentioned, uh, this conjecture tells us that all autocorrelations of the Louville function vanish. So the, the point is, OK, so that, that's, that's the clear formulation, but we will see in a while what kind of randomness this expression is, uh, is about. Uh, so for that, I need, I need some introduction to dynamics. So first, I will tell you a few words about topological dynamics, then ergodic theory. I hope that yesterday's exercises were, were helpful. Uh, OK, so what is a topological dynamical system? So already Vitaly uh, introduced uh, topological dynamical system. So simply we have homeomorphism on, on a contact metric space. Right? And we consider dynamics, which means I take a point, and then I, I look what, what the image of this point via t is, etc., etc., orbits, closure of orbits, etc. So one source to obtain a dynamical system is is via so-called subshifts. So what is a subshift? Well, th th this will be a class of dynamical systems which will be considered here. 
So to, to speak about subshifts, well, we need an alphabet. So for the purpose of this talk, the alphabet is, is well, a compact subset of the unit disk. So you may think about the circle, but you can also think about well, finitely many elements uh, of, the, of the unit disk. And then what, what we do is, well, we just take the space of two-sided sequences with the usual topology, product topology, so this is a compact space. And on that space, we have the natural action of the, of okay. the left shift. So now we have this big, big space and, and the subshift and, uh, and, and, the, and, the, uh, and the, the shift space. And we are considering all possible subsets which are closed and as <coughs> invariant. And if we take, if we restrict the S to the subset, so then we obtain clearly, clearly a topological dynamical system. So these are sub subshifts. So uh, now let's restrict to the following situation. I want to obtain a subshift. So suppose that I, I take a point in my, in, my, in my space. So what can we do? Well, we, we can take its orbit. So clearly this is an S invariant, S invariant set. And then we can take the closure of it to make it closed. And because we consider homeomorphism, so S is still acting, acting on this closure. So th these are, uh, well, so-called transitive, transitive subshifts. So there is a dense orbit in, in, in them. So we are going to do this, this construction using our arithmetic functions. But, well, uh, there's a little trouble that these are one-sided sequences that they are defined on N. So it doesn't matter how do we extend such a function to the left side, to the negative numbers, but well, that's what, what I, uh, I like to do is just to symmetrize. Why not? <laughs> okay, so let's, if you have one-sided sequence, don't worry, you just complete, complete it on the left as, as you want, in fact. Well, so let's, let's, let's see examples. So if you take the Mebius function, so the alphabet is clearly 0, 1, minus 1. Okay, then you symmetrize this function, and then you take the, the, then you take the closure of the orbit via the shift. So we obtain something. So this will be called a Mebius subshift. The same story with the Louville. This will be even easier, right? Because the alphabet is only minus one, one. And we obtain this Louville, Louville subshift. Uh, okay, we need the notion of the entropy of, of a topological dynamical system. So fortunately, we are in the context of subshifts, where this is much easier. And you see that the definition is simply, well, Fix n, you have your subshift, so consider all points in your subshift, look at the windows of lens n, so you will read blocks, so count how many of them you obtain. Okay, so this is this, is this, this number here, then you take the log, so you obtain a sequence which is sub-additive, once you, you divide by, by n, you know that the limit exists. And this is, this is the topological entropy of, of, of your subshift. Okay, but we are going to do, in fact, ergodic theory, and ergodic theory deals with, with measures which are invariant under the action of of our homeomorphism, right? So we start. So we have a homeomorphism of of, of a compact metric space X, uh, and this is the the usual, usual classical theorem that this space is 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 is, is metrizable and it is compact in the weak star topology. Uh, and then, okay, we have this, this homeomorphism, so we are interested in measures which are invariant. It's maybe not clear at that moment what is this set, but, but certainly it is closed. More than that, if we, you have invariant measures, so if you take convex combinations or generalized con convex con combinations, so clearly you stay in, in the same set. So in other words, this set is this set is, is convex. Once, once it's convex, so then you are interested in extremal okay. points. What are extremal points? So it is just to remember that these are e er exactly those measures which m make measure theoretic system which is, which, which is ergodic. Now, uh, so Vitaly mentioned yesterday that, well, this, the fact that this set is non-empty, it is of Bogolubov theorem, we will prove this theorem because this, this is an easy observation and, well, and we will use this, this, this kind of, of construction. So what, what do we do? We take a, we, we, just to show that this set is non-empty, we take a point little x, 
and we look at its orbit. Uh, and so what you see here, so we, we take an initial piece of, this, of, of the orbit and we, 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 we consider purely atomic measure with, which, which with all points of, this, of the same mass, which is one over the length of the initial, initial piece of the orbit. So we obtain something which is called an empiric measure. So we have empiric measure. So, but now, this is, of course, this measure is not T invariant unless the point is periodic. But I rather think that this is not a periodic point, so we really obtain something. And now the, the limit measure, <coughs> the limit measure is clearly T invariant because if you take the difference, or maybe I, because I didn't write what is the definition of weak star topology, but you see that this is somehow you have measures here, the, 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 the limit measure, so if you want to see that this, you have a convergence, so you, you, you look at the integrals for test fu functions, which in this case are just continuous functions. So you, when you take the difference here, so you see a lot of cancellations, only two measures survive, but you divide one over n. So it's clear that in the limit, it, it will contribute as zero, so in other words, this measure is invariant. Okay. So in this way, we know that this, 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 this set is non-empty, and then usual, well, something like Klein, Klein theorem tells us that, of course, this set is also non-empty. Non so there are ergodic measures. Well, anyway, sometimes it happens that the whole sequence of, ergot, uh, of empiric measures converges, and in this case, we, we, we say that the point is generic for the, for the limit measure. So please remember this notion, it, 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 will, be, it will be used. Uh, but in general, of course, if I take any point x, so I obtain probably many limits, and then we are talking about quasi-genericity. And so here is with a certain notion which is also to be remembered. So I take the point x, we look at, at the empiric measures given by this point x. All measures which I obtain in this way are called visible measures. So these are visible measures, but well, let's say visible measures from the point x. Okay. So, so, so far, this is the classical way of averaging, Cesaro, Cesaro averages. But there is no, I mean, why not to consider other ways of averaging? And the logarithmic averaging was already used by, by Terence Tau in one of his lectures. And so let's see what happens if, instead of Cesaro averaging, we, we do logarithmic averaging. So now we still deal with empiric measures, but now this initial piece of the orbits, the, the points in that are not of the same mass, but we, we give them these harmonic masses. So of course, this, this number which is here, it can be replaced by the log, but we, especially when we pass to, to the limit. So why, the, why this, is this measure, the limit measure invariant? So you make this, well, this little computation, and of course here there are not so many cancellations, but there are no cancellations. But you see, of course, these, these two, uh, remember that we will be dividing by y, uh, by log of log, uh, we will be dividing by log of nk, so the sequence which is going to zero. So, of course, this doesn't matter, this doesn't matter, and what you see, what you, what you see here, fortunately, when you, you see a, a, a series which is convergent. So, when we divide by log, log nk, so this, this, will, this will go to zero, so the limit measure is also invariant. <coughs> so, we can speak now about measures which are visible in the, well, from this logarithmic averaging. In general, so now it's a, li a little warning. So in general, these two se if you look at uh, the sets of visible measures using one way or the other way of averaging, so they can be completely disjoint. Uh, so one more thing is that, well, if I look at this set, and also the same with the logarithms, so this set is all always connected. So uh, once we know that, that this is always connected, so it's either just one point, so the point is generic, or there is uncountable many measures visible from a point. Okay, so of course, uh, going slowly back to, to our context, when we, have, when we have an arithmetic function, so we are going to, so we, we, we take this function, we take this subshift generated by this, this function, we treat this 
function as a point in our subshift space. And then we, we consider the corresponding empiric measures and the limits of this of these measures. That's 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 the object we are going to study. Uh, so any measure theoretic system which we obtained in this way is called a Furstenberg system of our arithmetic function. So we have two kind of first, Furstenberg systems. So let's say Cesaro Furstenberg systems and the logarithmic Furstenberg systems. And remember that's either one measure or uncountably many. I'm sorry, so uh, yes. it's a bit fast. I mean, I'm not able to read all of this. Can you go to the previous slide? So in your definition, u is an element of this shift, and then you have some space, x u, yes. which is some other space, and now this kappa is a measure on that space. Yes. V of u is a set of measures on a to the z. So what's the relation between a to the z and x u? No, the measures, they are defined on x sub u. These are measures on x sub u. Okay, so what is v of u? What's its so these are, no, v of x, these are all measures which are visible from on the point what? x. Measures on what? On your space, which you consider. Ah, x u is a subset of a to the z. x is a subset of a, yes, okay. yes, yes, of course. This is not some other of u. Ah, okay, thank you. Because you any okay. measure theoretic dynamical system XU, but XU is something we know. Absol about. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Uh, is it? Okay, so we have the system, so okay. So then we have well, one basic theorem uh, in dynamics, one more basic theorem in dynamics, so, which tells us that if we have a topological dynamical system, so we know what already what its entropy, topological entropy is, but in fact it's the supremum of all measure theoretic entropies for all invariant measures which we have on our, on our space. So uh, I didn't explain what is the measure theoretic entropy, and I have to do it, and I don't want to spend the whole lecture on defining the entropy. So remember that we are still in the context of subshifts. Okay, so subshifts only are considered. So th then it can be done rather quickly. So we need to understand the, the, the measure theoretic entropy, the, or the entropy of the measure. <clears throat> so now the, the crucial observation is that, so I'm interested, remember that S is a subshift, S is just this left shift. So I want to interpret now what, is the, what, what does it mean that I have an invariant measure. So because we have a subshift, so then we have the natural projection on coordinates. Right? So they are denoted by pi 0, pi 1, pi, well, pi n in general. So you may think that I have this pi composed with s to the n, and you may think, okay, I have a, I have a process, right? I have a sequence of random variables. I want to see that this process is stationary, but to, to speak about stationarity, I need a measure. Right? So now I'm, I'm just saying that to the, the fact that I have a measure on which is as invariant is nothing but the fact that the process which I obtain, well, by looking at the, at the project, is a stationary process. If I know that the alphabet is finite, so I obtain a stationary process, uh, stationary process uh, which takes on the finite many values. So the only thing we have to understand is that how to define the entropy of the process taking finite many values. And this is quick. Because first, we, we just define what is the entropy of a single variable, random variable. So if you, if you have a single, a single random variable, so the, its entropy is just defined by this well-known, I'm pretty sure, well-known for everybody here, formula. And then if you have, if you have a, a, a process, so what you do, okay, we, we assume that only finite many values are taken. So then what we do is that this is, you know, this vector, is, is this w which is here? We compute its entropy. What we obtain is a sequence which is subadditive, and then we can pass to the limit. So that's the definition of the entropy of the process of, of, of a stationary process. Okay. So so by by the entropy of the measure, we understand the entropy of this process. So pi n does not change 
That's, that's crucial, right? Pi n does not change, but because we consider many measures, many invariant measures, so then in fact these processes are completely different. Everything depends on the distribution of these processes. Okay, so by the way, of course, if we, if we have two random variables and we know what is jointed distribution and of, of this, I mean, what is the distribution of this vector, we can continue, we can introduce the notion of conditional entropy. And the conditional entropy is defined by this formula. And, but you can see easily that this is just, we compare the entropy of the vector, this, this, this vector, and, and the entropy of the condition. So now, slowly we are going to some basic theorem, basic facts uh, about the entropy, namely that the entropy of the process, which I recall the definition here is defined as this limit, it's nothing but the conditional entropy of the first variable with respect to the past of the process. So of course I cheat here a little bit because this is, this is not a finite vector, but I hope I can just skip this. And, but this is just to show that a certain natural limit exists. So we have, we have this formula and now let's, let's see some facts. So if, if you look at the definition, so of course the entropy of, of this Z0 variable must be maybe, I mean, the entropy of the process cannot, cannot be larger than the entropy of, of, of a single variable here, but the, if it is the case that we have equality, so this is exactly the case of, of independent process. On the other side of the hill, so we have processes, so we have this independent process. On the other side, we, uh, we are interested in so-called deterministic processes. So the process is deterministic by definition if its entropy is equal to zero. Why it is called deterministic? Well, uh, classical theorem tells us that the process is deterministic if and only if the presence is measurable with respect to the past. Okay, so Z0, so Z0 is measurable with respect to the, to the past, so the past determines everything. So a topological dynamical system is deterministic if and only if all stationary processes given by all invariant measures are deterministic, just to, to conclude. Uh, and now, finally, we can, we can recall what we can write once more about Vitaly wrote yesterday, Sarnak's conjecture tells us that if we take a topological dynamical system which is deterministic, so then we, we want to show that in fact all continuous observables in the system are uncorrelated or are ortho orthogonal to the Mebius function. So uh, please remember that this is, Sarnak's conjecture is not about orthogonality of the Mebius function to a single sequence, but we are interested to be orthogonal to a bunch of sequences, right? You have a dynamical system, and if you want a, a maybe not completely trivial exercise, so obviously mu is orthogonal to mu square, right? Because you obtain mu cube, which is mu, and, and the, the mean of mu is equal to zero but show that it is, it is not the case that x sub mu squared is orthogonal to mu. Which of course is an indication that the subshift of square free numbers has positive entropy. Right? Otherwise, well, okay, so this is just vocabulary. So we speak sometimes that Sanders conjecture is satisfied for a system which is maybe not completely correct, right? Strictly speaking. Uh, then uh, yeah, there is this issue, I mean, well, we consider mu, but why not to, to try with ad, other multiplicative functions? So Louisville, this is for sure, right? We should consider some next conjecture with that. With other functions, it's not so, not so obvious, but, well, there is this special class introduced by, by, by Terence Tao, Kaisa Matomeki, and Maxim Rajivu, the strongly aperiodic multiplicative functions, I think that here we can, uh, we can think that, we can uh, think that uh, Sarnax conjecture also holds when we replace mu by, by, by such, such a function. Uh, so now uh, the point is, okay, so Sarnax conjecture, is it satisfied in some obvious system? If we take one point system, so it is satisfied because if I take 
a constant <coughs> function here. So then uh, we come back to the mean of, of the Mebius function, which is zero. This is prime number theorem. If you take a periodic system, it will also be satisfied, but we, you have to use the Richlet theorem. If we continue this, so, uh, so it means if we continue with little systems, dynamical systems, so then we, we, we should think that dynamics doesn't bring anything. Right? The system is too simple, so it must be number, number theory. So it is not surprising what, what I, uh, I, I told you about this one-point system or a finitely many-point system. Uh, but this is somehow you have to enter it to, to continue this kind of observations. You have to go to short intervals, and will not, I will not be speaking about short intervals today. Uh, okay. So because, well, I'm representing ergodic theory, so a natural question which, uh, which arises is what happens with Sandax conjecture when we don't require that this is for all X's. Okay, so we have a system, a topological system, but we have many measures, so we can pick one of these measures, invariant measures, and we can ask what happens with the convergence almost everywhere. So then let's see, let's see what happens, in fact. Uh, so this, this is already in the, in the article of, of, of Sarnak, even though the proof I'm, uh, I'm giving here is it's, it's completely different than what is, what is in, in, in Sarnak's paper. So, okay, so now we, so we claim the following, that if we have a measure theoretic system, and sorry, I should stop for a while here, because the, I hope that you notice that when I write uh, an arithmetic function, which, which, which means a sequence of complex numbers, so I boldface the letter. So, Louville, Louville function or the Mebius function, they are boldfaced. In number theory, they, they are not bold. <laughs> The mu and lambda, but in ergodic theory, as you could see in the lectures of, of Vitali, so mu is, is an invariant measure. So we cannot give up with this notation. So I hope, so you, you see here the formula with two mu's, right? But I hope that once, one, one thing is that this is bold phase, and the other is that from the context you see what is the fun arithmetic function, what is, what is a measure. So this is on purpose, but I could have changed this, but. I didn't do it. Well, anyway, so we want to show that almost everywhere convergence holds. So let's start with be even less ambitious and let's try to think about L2 convergence. So you see, so I, I look now at an ergodic theorem in L2, right? So these are, these are functions in L2. And then I have this numeric, numerical weights. So this, this is an ergodic theorem with weights. So I, I'm interested what's happening to, to this sum. <clears throat> okay, so now the spectral theorem tells me you can replace this number by this number. So this is, this is replaced by no, uh, L2 norm of a trigonometric polynomial. And, but here, what, uh, so, uh, this, is, this is computed on, on the circle on which we have a certain measure. What is this measure? Well, it's well, if you know something uh, about ergodic theory, spectral theory. So this is this is so-called spectral measure of this of this function which we have here. Okay, it doesn't matter because well, I have to compute this expression, but I can look at this even pointwise. And if I want to look at it pointwise, so now I'm the crucial fact which I'm going to use as a black box is a, is a result of Davenport, which tells us that not only mu is orthogonal to the sequence z to the n, <coughs> but we see that this is ortho uh, orthogonality means that when I divide by, by n, so this is going to zero. So it's not only going to zero, but there is also a speed. Well, with the sequence one over log two n, in fact, this two can be replaced by any constant, but uh, not use this fact. Well, anyway, so of course, if I have, if we agree that we have this, and this is this is this is uniform in Z, so then it means that this is this is just going to zero. So this is just going to zero. So in other words, if if you look at this uh, L2 version of Sarnax conjecture, so it holds everywhere, right? Uh, and in fact, I could have replaced even this T by by unitary operators on Hilbert spaces. Well, anyway, so let's think about. 
almost everywhere convergence, which is harder to achieve. Uh, okay, so to obtain this uh, almost everywhere convergence, so let's assume that the function we consider is, is bounded. Okay, and now we are going to use the fact that we have a speed. Okay, so, uh, so instead of a capital, uh, this capital N, let, let's consider special Ns first. So which is, we take rho, which is greater than, the, than 1, and well, we consider special, special Ns here. And we want to see what happens to the L2 norm. We have seen already that how to compute this L2 norm. So because of Davenport result, we see that this L2 norm is bounded by, by such a sequence. So, of course, what, what is important here is that we obtain 1 over k square, and this is a series which is summable. Right? So, so we obtain that a certain functional uh, series is absolutely summable, but we are in a Hilbert space, right? So, it's, if it is absolutely summable, so it is summable. So, I know that I obtain a function here which is almost everywhere finite. Almost everywhere fine. So, okay, so now I have this subset of, of measure one on which I, I see that this, is, this, this, this series is convergent. So, in particular, this is going to zero. <coughs> okay, of course, this, uh, this all depends on rho, but if I use countably many rows, so I will not lose this condition almost everywhere. Well, and then I hope that the, the, the end of the proof is. It's easy to see, right? We take arbitrary n, well, we uh, take this, well, bounds on, on, on n, and we just divide the sum we are interested in into two subsums. And on one of them, we use the fact that we know that we have a convergence almost everywhere, and here we just, we, we just use the fact that f, f is bounded. And because this expression is going to rho minus 1, basically. So when rho is going to 1, we will obtain 0. So it means that we have a, conver we have a convergence, convergence, convergence almost everywhere. So to pass to any L1 function, we use the fact that L infinity, fu uh, L infinity functions are dense in L1 norm. And then, uh, of course, then uh, it looks that we are in trouble because so what? Right? Uh, what we need that this limit exists, but somehow we want to sh we want to say that this, this limit is small. So I come back to what Vitali presented yesterday. If we assume that the measure is ergodic, we know what the limit is, and it will be the distance between these two functions in L1. So the the only thing is to notice that the problem we are dealing with can be treated. Uh, in this problem, we can assume without losing. Generality that the, 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 the measure is ergodic. If the measure is not ergodic, you just decompose this into pieces. On each of them, and you you repeat the reasoning on each of the pieces. Everywhere you obtain almost everywhere condition, and you you put these things these things together. So now, okay. But this is I mean. So this was just to show you that uh, in this reasoning entropy didn't play any role. Right? So the Sandax conjecture is, in fact, not so much interesting right? in, in this context. So you can guess that what makes Sandax conjecture difficult is the fact that we require that in our topological dynamic system, all point x has to be taken, have to be taken into, into account. OK, and now let's, let's go to the genuine motivation, uh, which was behind, behind uh, Sandax conjecture. Namely, well, I recall, I think I recall here, Chawla conjecture, which is about vanishing all autocorrelations of the Liu, all autocorrelations of the Liouville function. I think I should. So notice that if I want to, and we want to interpret this condition dynamically, we want to see what does it mean from from the ergodic or from from uh, from the point of view of dynamics. So if you look at this expression. So I can rewrite this expression using this empiric. So, so it's once more Louisville function is treated as a point in the sub in this in the subshift space x sub lambda. Okay. So if you want to compute this expression, it's exactly the same as you you take this empiric measure and you compute 
the integral of this of this random variable. So now, if you go to the limit here, you go to the limit here. But the limit here is just the limit of, of these empiric measures. You remember that any limit which we obtain in this way, we called a Furstenberg system of the Liouville function. So, so in fact, if I knew what, what the... Well, anyway, so uh, potentially I have uncountably many Furstenberg systems at the end here. But what we require is that the integral, all the integrals like that, disappear. How is this possible? Okay, so I have a measure, or I have a measure on that space, right? And this measure has the property that all these integrals disappear. So, so remember that this pi is taking only two values, minus one and one. Was well, one measure which satisfies this condition that well all these integrals, okay, which you, you put here the limit measure is clear is clear the, the Bernoulli measure one half one half when the process is independent. But we are using so many so many functions here. Remember that they take only values one and minus one, so you don't need to consider powers, or well, powers are implicit in this expression if you like. So the Stone-Weierstrass theorem tells you, okay, there is only one measure which can satisfy this condition. Okay, so Chawla conjecture is nothing but the fact that the Louisville function has only one, is a generic point, and this is a generic point for the Bernoulli measure one half, one half. Very clear statement. So, and now uh, we want to show uh, Sanak's conjecture, it looks dynamically, well, maybe it's not so clear this is ergodic theory or topological dynamics, but well, we'll see it in a while. So we want to show now that the implication Chawla implies Sandak is also a dynamical statement. So the proof of this implication, well, this was the, the, well, it was stated in, in, the, in, the, in the article of, of Peter Sandak, this implication, the, the proof of Sandak you can find on, 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 on the blog of, of Terence Tao. And the proof which I will show you is, is, is different. It's just, just using dynamics. Uh, Okay, so, uh, so, so the, the first step will be to show that if we assume Chawla, Chawla is for, for the reveal function, so we are going to prove Chawla, uh, we are going to prove Sarnak first for, for the reveal function, and then somehow we have to show that it also holds for, for the Mebius function. So let's enjoy this, well, these two steps now. Okay, so we have this deterministic system, topological dynam dynamical system, <coughs> and we, we have a point x, and then we have this continuous function f. So what do we do? So first we treat lambda as a point in our subshift space, as usual. Right? So we are in the space x cross x sub lambda. So in that, that space we can consider the point x, comma, Louisville function. And we consider now in the product space, under the product transformation, we consider empiric measures. Okay, it's a compact, this is a compact space, nothing has changed. Okay, so it means that, well, I can go to a limit along a subsequence, and what can I say about the limit? So remember that, of course, you, you can say, well, so, what we know is that the measure which we obtain will be t cross s invariant. Okay, it is. But in fact, more can be said because the weak topology, the weak star topology, which we consider, so this is test functions are functions, continuous functions depending on two coordinates. So we can consider functions depending on one coordinate, on the first coordinate or on the second coordinate. And it means that you will be, when you consider that, then it means that you will say something about the marginals of, 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 the, of, of the measure law. Right? So the on, it will only, if you take a function depending on the first coordinate, so everything will depend only on, on the transformation t, nothing more than that, and x. So in other words, I have to obtain something like a joining. Again, I, I hope that this was already introduced yesterday. No, it wasn't. Okay, so if, if it wasn't, so there is this footnote here, which means that joining is a measure which is invariant and which has correct marginals. <coughs> So of course on the first, on the first <coughs> coordinate I cannot say what is the exact what is this measure new. I, I know that this is a certain invariant measure on the first coordinate. 
But on the second coordinate, due to my assumption that we assume that Chawla holds, so the point was on the second coordinate, the point was is generic for, for the Bernoulli measure. On the second coordinate, I have to obtain, or, or, obtain this, this, this Bernoulli measure. Okay, and the only, uh, and the only thing which I have to prove is that this integral vanishes, right? Remember, this is, this is, the, this is exactly the limit. Oops. This is exactly the limit which I have here. So this, this is replaced by, by, the, by the rule. Okay, so that's the only thing we have to prove. Okay. So I said that not, not, not so much can be said about the, the, the first coordinate, except of the fact that nu is a, is a t invariant measure, but t is supposed to be but T is, it was assumed to be uh, deterministic, topologically deterministic. So by the variation, variational principle, I, I, I know that the, measure, that the entropy of the measure nu is also equal to zero. So it's a measure theoretic deterministic system. So now the, the, crucial, the crucial thing is that Furstenberg in, in, I think I wrote here something. That, that, so what we are going to show now that is that if you take the Bernoulli system here, so it is disjoint in the sense of Furstenberg with any zero entropy automorphism. Okay, and disjointness, because well, it was not, so disjointness means that the only joining between these two transformations is just product measure. There is nothing non trivial. Uh, okay, because if I, if I know that the measure is, okay, so if I go up, if I know that I put here product measure, so the, the integral of the tensor will be just the product of integrals, and one of these integrals vanishes because of prime number zero. Okay, so, it, so the next, next observation is that, well, okay, I have this function f, I don't know much about this function f, but I can replace this function f by a function g, continuous function g, which takes all the finite and many values. I hope that this is, this is uh, easy to see because, well, we, we deal with joining. So I have to show that I can approximate, well, one integral by, by, by the other one. But if I, if I look at the difference of these integrals, so, well, it is clearly this. And if I forget, forget about pi zero, pi zero is bounded by one. So then uh, I, I, I'm not considering rho, but I consider, I'm considering only the, mar the first marginal of rho which is this measure nu, right? This is a joining. So, so then it's just the fact that this final functions taking finite values are, are, are dense in L1. Okay. So now let's, let's sum up what we have, what we have, to, what we have to prove. So we have this independent process, pi n. Okay, this is Chawla, which is telling us that we deal with independent process, and the other one is, is, is a deterministic process. Why? And this deterministic process is given by, by, by <coughs> well, uh, the action of, of, of t. And, well, we fix this function g, and so this is a stationary process because, well, we consider a measure theoretic dynamical system, and we have finite many values because we have chosen g to have finite many values. Okay, and now, so here's the crucial now sequence of inequalities. Uh, they come, basically, they come from, from the original article of Furstenberg from 1967. So let's, let's see quickly what's happening. So we start with the entropy of, of the process pi. Okay, so they, clearly this entropy is smaller than if I take two processes, so right, pi, pi and y together, and then we use sub some additivity, so which is just some of these two processes, but because this process is deterministic, so we have this. But the process is independent, so the, I know what is the entropy. It's just the entropy of the random variable. Okay, so now second line. So we have this because uh, the first line in the first line because we have here the same the same thing. So we have equalities everywhere. So in fact, this. The entropy of this variable is exactly the entropy of this process. The entropy of this process is the conditional entropy of the presence of the, uh, of the process with respect to the past. Okay, I just wrote 
this one of these basic theorems. And let's let's now to continue. So I take this h. I come back to this, this line. So this h pi zero <coughs> is smaller than. So what is it? Uh, okay. So we use uh, subadditivity of the conditional entropy with respect to the let's say first coordinate. So it is smaller than this one. But this one is equal to zero because y because the process y because y zero is certainly measurable with respect to the condition, so we cannot we cannot so the entropy this conditional entropy is equal to zero and, and of course the conditional entropy which we have here is, is by by definition smaller than the entropy of the, of the variable, but we started with this entropy we we, we finished with the, with the same expression so everywhere we have we have equalities. So what do we obtain finally? We obtain that the entropy of this variable is the same as the conditional entropy of this variable with respect to the, uh, with respect to the, to the past uh, of this double process here. How is this possible? Well, uh, if you have a condition and you didn't lose any entropy, so the only possibility is that these events are independent. So then it means that the, this pi zero is independent with respect to the past of this double process. Well, so pi zero is independent of, of the past of this process. So of course it will be independent with respect to any sub sigma algebra of, of, of the past. So I can take the past of the process y, but the past of the process y is everything, right? Because the, the, the past de determines everything. We are in a deterministic process. So then now we, we prove that pi zero is independent of the sigma algebra generated by y. And this is this is the end. This is the end of the proof. Uh, so I didn't I didn't prove first of all this joint I mean, this jointness, but it's it's exactly the same reasoning. You have to replace pi zero by by certain certain vector here, but this is not what we are interested in for this lecture. So now, okay, so we proved Sandak's conjecture for the reveal function, but how to, how to go to the Memmius function? So now I, uh, I will show you a reasoning which you can find in the introduction of one, one of, the, of the papers by, by Terence Tao. Uh, so this is, this is just number theory now. So the starting point is, uh, is, this, uh, is this identity. You can check it. So it reminds so much the Dirichlet uh, convolution and to show, I want to show that this holds. So how to show that it holds? Well, so this is a multiplicative function. If somehow I can see that this is also a multiplicative function, so then, well, it will reduce uh, our task. Uh, and you see that this, this reminds so much Dirichlet convolution. And so the proof is exactly the same as the fact that if you have two multiplicative functions, so the Dirichlet convolution remains multiplicative. Well, in fact, I, I wrote the proof here, right? Of course, everything is based on the fact that if you have two numbers which are a co-prime, and if you have a divisor, so then in fact you have to have two divisors, and then they are unique. So this is this is this is more or less obvious. And then you have to so the only because now both functions are multiplicative. So <coughs> the thing you have to check is that do they agree on the powers of the primes? And then uh, for for the first power, you just check, right? Because the only possibility will be to take one here, and if you take k greater than two, you you make you you want to compute this expression. So of course it will be one. Then it will be p, perhaps p square, right? Depends how how big k is, p cube, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is ridiculous, right? Because I know that I mean I wrote only two terms because if I take mu p square, so then it is already zero. So this is just, well, you see that this is really, really the case. So we have this, this identity. So once we have this identity, so now we try to prove that, in fact, Sandler's conjecture for the Riefer function implies Sandler's conjecture for the Mebius function. So we are interested to show that this expression is going to zero. So what we do is that we replace mu by, by, by the right-hand side of the identity on the, previous, on the previous slide. And what we do is just a little trick is that you have this t to the n here, so you replace t to the n by, you see, d square and n divided by d square, and then you change variables. Okay, we, so then you obtain a certain expression, and you see that I, 
multiplied by d squared and I divided by d squared, so nothing has changed. And now let's look at this expression. So uh, let's let's think that d d is d is fixed, d is fixed, but uh, n is going to infinity. So let's look at this part. So we have a transformation t to the d square. So t was deterministic. We, you can guess that all powers of t are also deterministic. We already have Sarnax conjecture for the Liouville function. So it means that these expressions are going to zero if d is fixed. So let's just think that d is for d is small, I know that this is going to zero. If d is big, so then I have fortunately this series which converges here. Okay, and you put this, these two facts together and I think about it. Oops, excuse me. Okay, so this is just uh, how, to, how to finish the proof. So, of course, in fact, Sandak's conjecture for Liouville function and the Mebius functions are equivalent. It's, this, it's the same story, but if you want to use a different direction, you use a di different identity. Also, ergodic proofs are possible, but it, it will be not, not so quick in this case. Okay. So then uh, I understand I have something like 10 minutes. I, I, is that right? Yeah. I don't remember how much. Yeah, it was something like seven past nine. Yeah. Okay, so I should tell you, okay, so this is uh, something about the beginning, the Sandax conjecture was 2010. Okay, so in ergodic theories, the people were somehow got interested but to, to Sandax conjecture, but Chamla conjecture implies Sandax conjecture, so okay, that's the main motivation. If we disprove Sandax conjecture, we disprove Chawla, but number theory people, I, I hope that Terence can... <laughs> believe that Chawla, Chawla holds, right? So Chawla implies Sarnak, so, but, so even if we prove Sarnak's conjecture, so then, so what? If we disprove that there is a counterexample to Chawla, but Chawla is true for sure. Well, so this, this, this was a kind of controversy. Uh, and of course the situation, uh, the situation uh, could change if we somehow prove that it's not only an implication, but it's, it's deeper than that. And oh, you can okay so okay so so then the, let's consider I, I think it was already in, in in one of your lectures that we can consider the now logarithmic versions of Sarnax conjecture and uh, and, Ch uh, and 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 Chawla conjecture so this is this kind of you have these harmonic weights here so Chawla conjecture is just assuming that these limits are equal to zero and by repeating really what for words, uh, you, you rephrase this in the dynamical language, the logarithmic Chawla conjecture holds, if and only if uh, Louisville is logar logarithmically generic for the Bernoulli measure one half, one half. So it's exactly the same. Sandak's conjecture well, also can be rephrased in an easy way. And then the, the theory came. Uh, and you see that uh, Sarnak's conjecture, logarithmic uh, Chawla conjecture, is equivalent to, uh, to logarithmic Chawla is, is, is equivalent to logarithmic Sarnak's conjecture. So, the, of course, this, to me, it was well, the end of the discussion, you know, why we should try in, in, in dynamics to prove uh, Sarnak's conjecture using, using methods of ergodic theory of dynamics in general. It's a, another matter if we can be successful, but that's, at least we should try. Uh, so I will not tell you, I will not present the proof because well, you can guess that this is, this is a complicated theorem, a deep theorem, but I would like to tell you uh, what happens if we go back to, to the original Chawla conjecture and to the original Sandax conjecture. Uh, so I, I have only a few minutes. And I, okay, so let's let's first let's see uh, a general proposition. So this this comes from a joint paper with with Sasha Gomilko from Kiev. I mean, Ek, I mentioned from Kiev and uh, Dominik Kwiatniak. <coughs> 
So we have a topological, uh, topological system and we have, I, I said, I told you at, uh, a few minutes ago that if you look at measures which are logarithmically visible from a point and the measures which are visible I mean, in the sense of Cesaro, so in fact we can obtain, so these sets can, they can be disjoint. But in fact, there are relations between these two sets. And you see that the relation is that if you take the convex, the closed convex envelope of this Cesaro visible measures, so then in fact you capture all logarithmic, uh, logarithmically visible, visible measures. So, and there is a proof, but I, I think I, I will skip it. Well, maybe, maybe not everything I will skip, but. Uh, Okay, but I think it's on the, the crucial is on the next slide. So the point is, how can we compare? Okay, the, so we have this harm, uh, we have this logarithmically average. It, it is, it's one over log n, which is missing here, but uh, we will divide later. So the point is that we can we can apply here this uh, trick uh, of summation by parts. So we do this, right? So, so these are these are Cesaro average. So these are okay. I have the measure here. So I, I, I look at the difference of of Cesaro averages, and we make computations. And you see that what we find at the end is that if you look at this logarithmic averages here what you obtain is a convex combination of Cesaro averages. Uh, right? when, when you divide it by one over log n, so the, here you, you have many Cesaro, Cesaro averages, but you divide by one over n plus one, so it, 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 the sum of them is, is almost log, log of n. So it is really something of that kind. And then you have to well, transform this obs observation into this concrete Concrete theorem. Yeah, I think it's okay. So let's. Okay, so this was. Uh, okay. So now, but now the crucial corollary comes. We want to show that now we can say that if we take an ergodic measure, which is logarithmically visible from the point X, it would be also visible in, 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 the, in the Cesaro sense. Right? And this is maybe not. Not so obvious. I'm not claiming what kind of subsequences are, what are the relations between subsequences. <coughs> and but let's see why this condition holds. So let's recall another. I was well, using, not using, or implicitly using Krein theorem. But now I want to use Milman theorem. It's not Krein Milman theorem, but it's Milman theorem. And this Milman theorem tells us the following. That if you have a compact set in a locally convex space, and if you take the closed convex envelope of, of this set, so then the extremal points of this closed envelope, they have to come from, from the set you started with. So if you want the intuition, so just imagine, so you, we are in the three-dimensional space, so you, you have some, some points in that space, and then you have a material, and you wrap it around. And then you look where are the vertices, okay, of what you obtain. But where are the vertices? Well, I don't know, of course, where the vertices, but the vertices must come from the set you started with. Okay, so this is, so this, this theorem is very intuitive. And now, how to use it in our context? Well, okay, so you have, you have this, space, the, this set of visible, of visible measures, which is, which is a, uh, Closed, so compact subspace. That well, the the environment is also you know locally convex, convex spaces. So there is no problem with that. <coughs> and you remember that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that the extremal point of the of the set of invariant measures. These are exactly ergodic measures. <coughs> so, so let's see what happens now. So we are interested in ergodic measures, which are visible in the logarithmic way. From the point X, so the the, the, pro, uh, the proposition which was well, not rested uh, and proved, but you will, will, but this this the slides will be accessible for all of you. So, 
it is contained in, I don't change this set, I just change this logarithmically visible measures by, by the convex envelope of Cesaro, visible measures, <coughs> and then the, the, the what do I want? Oh, okay, so because this measure is ergodic, so it's, it's ergodic, so it's an external point in, 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 a, in, in a much lo in a larger set, so it will be set in a, uh, an external point of that. And be, but, the, but the only the only external point in this set are you have to come back to this k, the set k, right? They have to the vertices they come from from visible. So so that then it proves that we obtain a measure which is visible visible from X in the Cesaro sense. Okay, so now to to conclude, if we assume that Sanax conjecture holds, so then the logarithmic Sanax conjecture holds. If Cesaro averages converge, so then the logarithmic, converge, uh, logarithmic averages also converge. So the logarithmic Sanax conjecture holds using using Tao's theorem. We obtain logarithmic logarithmic Chawla conjecture holds. So which means that we have this. But clearly the Bernoulli measure is ergodic. It's an external point. So if this, this is ergodic, so then it means, because of, of, of this corollary, that we also have to see a subsequence along which the Cesaro, Cesaro averages converge. So, uh, of course, well, uh, we obtained something more than that, right? If we obtained that if, well, any, any ergodic Furstenberg system for the logarithmic averages uh, is also visible in the Cesaro sense, and, well, and of course, you need not to use lambda here, the, the, the reasoning is completely, completely general. But then uh, Tao, uh, Terence Tao improved uh, immediately this result. Because we will not, of course, this theorem doesn't tell you anything about the subsequence along which you see, you see your measure. Uh, and uh, you can strengthen this result and to obtain that in this context, you obtain that this, the subsequence along which you see you see Bernoulli measure is a full logarithmic logarithmic density. And I think I, I, I stop here. So these, these, these are papers.